Well, Shoreline Church, in the middle of this COVID season, it's been an interesting time. As a matter of fact, one of the things I did early on when we realized that the world was changing is that we canceled a lot of our guest preachers. Uh, we actually shifted some of our church pastors off the preaching schedule. I took more of the preaching, but uh, we've got a guest preacher today, and that's because uh, everything's over and it's all better and all done with. No, that's not the case at all. There's a lot going on still, and we're praying uh, for all those that are, that are dealing with challenges at this time, but we do have a guest preacher, and Josh Laxon is here with his wife, Jody, and they've uh, left their three kids at home in Wheaton, Illinois. With, with an adult. With an adult, with, with an a, a grown-up, yeah. uh, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a grandparent, and they're, I'm sure they're having a wonderful time. Uh, but I'm thankful to have Josh here. I met Josh when he came on the staff of the Billy Graham Center uh, in Wheaton, Illinois. Uh, a friend of mine, Ed Stetcher, who's preached here, and many of you know Ed, uh, said, you got to meet this, this new young guy that's on our staff. And I said, what qualifies for young these days? Because I feel young. And he said, a lot younger than you. <laughs> and so i uh, got a couple decades. i got a couple dec- decades on you, Josh. Yeah. But uh, just fell in love with Josh. His heart for the Lord, his heart for the church, and his heart for the world, for the gospel. And so we have the privilege of, of welcoming Josh here. I encourage you to open your hearts to receive as we think about what, who is Jesus as the Messiah, the Messiah who's coming. What difference does that make? How does that transform our life? So will you pray with me for yourself to be open and ready to receive the message? And will you pray with me for Josh that God would speak through him to all of us? Let's pray together. Oh, Lord God, we thank you for the body of Christ. Your people are scattered all around the world. And I want to thank you for, for Josh and for Joni and for their family and for the fact that he's here with us this weekend and just, just sharing in this time. I pray that you would open every one of our hearts to receive the message you have for us, that we will, we will see you differently and we will live differently and we will share your love in a fresh new way because we've been together and looked at your word. We pray for Josh, Lord, that you would fill him, you would anoint him. We know, Lord, he's prepared a message, but would you just... Just empower him with your presence to bring this message in a way that just speaks directly to our hearts. So Lord, bless us as we receive. Bless Josh as he preaches. And Jesus, be glorified in this time together. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen. I encourage you to open your hearts and receive God's word. Thanks, Pastor Kevin. Well, Shoreline, welcome. I really was expecting to be in the courtyard. I have been internet stalking you for quite some time now. And I, let's just put it this way. Coming from Wheaton, Illinois, it's a little cold there. So a lot of outdoor gatherings, you know, it's just probably uncomfortable. And so as I've been watching you online on Sunday, seeing the California sunshine, even though with a little crisp coolness in the air, I was like, man, I cannot wait to get there and to be with the Shoreline family. And so uh, I actually have to apologize because undoubtedly I brought the cool, wet weather of Chicago with me. So I apologize. I pray if the Lord ever leads me here again that I will not do that. And I, you know, I cannot make that promise, but, but it is definitely good to be here. It is an honor. I definitely love your pastor and his wife. Now, I definitely know Sherry is the better half of the, of, of the Harney hole. Uh, there, yes, I mean, I even get an amen this morning from the pastor about that. But it is so good uh, to, I mean, really, uh, to open up God's Word, to know that I'm one of the few guest preachers of 2020. That is definitely an honor in in and of itself. So if you could, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask that you like and share this because God has given us a medium called technology and social media to share the good news of King Jesus to a lost and dying world. And so would you just go ahead and like and share this because we're going to be talking about the King or the Messiah who has come. And you can use those words interchangeably uh, because the Jews were looking forward to a Messiah in the Old Testament the anointed one. What's interesting is uh, that word Messiah, the anointed one, it was in reference to king, priest, and prophet in the Old Testament. What's interesting is that Jesus fulfills all of those offices. He is the prophet, priest, and king, but Matthew he is going to actually, throughout his entire gospel, constantly reference how Jesus is the Messiah, the King who has come. So he wants the Jews to know that the promised King has come in the person of Jesus. Now, before I go any further, here I have a question that I want to ask you this morning. Well, when it comes to Christmas, and Merry Christmas, by the way, but but here's a question that I have. What is one of the distinguishing marks 
that the Christmas season is here. So what's one of the distinguishing marks that Christmas season is here? Now, you, you, you might say shopping, and you might say Christmas parties, which I'm sure there's not a lot of Christmas parties happening in California because there's not a lot of Christmas parties happening in Illinois. So, so you might say that, but here's one of the distinguishing marks. Music, singing. Now, the Laxton family, uh, we got started early. Uh, we actually started decorating and playing Christmas music and watching Christmas movies after Halloween. We normally do it after Thanksgiving, but this year it's 2020. Everything is up for grabs, okay? So we started singing Christmas songs. Now, I ran across an article that was written last year by Times uh, Magazine, or, or, or Newsweek, actually. And the article was entitled, uh, The Top 20 Best-Selling Christmas Songs of All Time. Now, I'm not going to list all 20 songs. I'm going to give you the top 10 from 10 down to 1. Let me share them with you. Blue Christmas, Rocking Around the Christmas Tree, Mary Did You Know, which that's one of my favorites, by the way, Christmas Eve, uh, do you want to build a snowman? So think frozen, mistletoe, and then there was a tie for fourth. Uh, do they know it's Christmas? Rudolph the red-nosed reindeer. All I want for Christmas is you. Silent night and white Christmas. Now you might be saying, Josh, why? Why have you shared that with us? Because I, here's what I find interesting: that 20 percent of the songs that our culture believe are in the top kind of 10 songs of Christmas. Only, only two of them have to do with Jesus. So only 20% of the top 10 Christmas songs of all time have to do with Jesus. Now, I've often said uh, to uh, the churches that I've pastored and to leaders that I've been able to train that the songs of our culture and the movies of our culture actually offer up a cultural anthropology of what we believe, what we long for, uh, the desires of our heart. So it shouldn't surprise us then that our culture, 80% of the music or Christmas music in our culture has nothing to do with Jesus, but we do have a little bit of you know, spiritual songs sprinkled in there. So when I look at the list, here's what is, is most important to our culture. They just want to have some fun. They want to rock around the Christmas tree. Now, another thing is, is that they just want some love. Like Elvis Presley's Blue Christmas, I'll have a blue. Like, and, and Cole, I, I, I am definitely not you know, trying out for the band. Uh, but the other one is a mistletoe. They just want to get a little action, you know, a little smoochy smooch here, there. Uh, they long for nostalgia. Now, White Christmas is actually one of my favorite songs. And Bing Crosby in White Christmas is actually one of my favorite Christmas movies of all time. You know, but it's all about nostalgia. Nostalgia. I'm dreaming of a white. Like it's it's a great, great nostalgic song. But then you have a little bit of spirituality mixed in there. Now, why do I bring this up? Because we are in a series called Adore. Now, as I was preparing for this kind of this message, I thought about all of the variations of adore. And one of the variations and definitions is adorable. And when I think about the word adorable, I think about Ricky Bobby when he's sitting there praying. And he's like, dear baby Jesus, eight pounds, six ounces, so tiny, yet so omnipotent. Like, and I can really do a Ricky Bobby because I am from the South, even though I live in Wheaton, Illinois. But it's more of about adorable. And I think there's a lot of people that sometimes mistake Jesus for just that little baby baby who's such, you know, who's so adorable around Christmas time. Or, you know, you can think about, oh, you know, I adore him, meaning I have so much respect for him. And I think there's a lot of people in our culture today, they, they do adore Jesus. They, they have respect for him. They, they hold him in high esteem. But what we're looking at in this series is that we ought to adore. And there's, a, there's another word, adoration. We ought to worship Jesus. We ought to worship Worship the King. And when it comes to singing, the songs that we sing actually reflect the worship of our heart, especially those songs that are extremely meaningful to us. 
I mean, think about it this way. I know that there's probably a lot of songs that we like the rhythm, we like the beat, we like the melody, and sometimes we can just mouth the words, but, but they really don't resonate with us, but it's those songs that really resonate with us. It's those songs that have deep meaning to us, uh, that, that when we sing them, we are extremely passionate, uh, we, uh, we have this intensity about it because it's something meaningful to us. I love what C.S. Lewis says. I, he says this, I think we delight to praise what we enjoy because the praise not merely expresses but completes the enjoyment. It is the appointed consummation. And so what he's saying is that when it comes to songs that really mean, you know, mean something to us, then we just belt out. It's like an impulse that we have. Why? Because we have this impulse to Worship. Have you ever been watching American Idol or The Voice and the judges tell a singer, I mean, you, you sang that from the heart. What, what, what are they saying? They say, they're saying you connected with the words and we believed you. Now, could you imagine, like as believers, we're called to worship the king. What comes from our lips should also reflect in our lives. I mean, could you, I mean, could you imagine what the world would look like if believers, what come, what, what, what come from their lips would actually be reflected in their lives and the world would look at us and go, man, you really believe what you sing? Like, yes, that's it. We want to worship the king, not just through song but our lives. And so here's what we're going to flesh out for the next few moments. It's this main point. So let me go ahead and give you the main point. And if you're taking notes, just go ahead and write this down. The birth of the king should make our hearts want to sing. The birth of the king should make our hearts want to sing. And Matthew is really going to paint this picture really all throughout his gospels, but he's coming right out of the gate to saying, the king's come and, and, and you should want to worship him. You should want to sing to him. You should want your life to revolve and orbit around him. So let me pray and then we're going to flesh out this main point. Jesus, will you speak to us? Spirit, will you go to work conforming us more into the image of our king? For those who are far from you, maybe checking you out for the very first time, or they are scrolling through one of their friend's feed and they come across this, will, Spirit, will you bring conviction to their life? Would you, would you move in their heart and their minds to open up some room to give fault to who Jesus is? We're going to praise you for what you're going to do in this time that we have today, and it's in your name we pray, amen. So we're going to look at three things, answer three questions, basically. Here's question number one. Why the birth of the king should make our hearts want to sing? So why the birth of Jesus? Why why should his birth make us want to sing, make us want to Worship. I'm going to give you four reasons real quick, and I'm going to spend the, you know, the bulk of the time on point one, so don't get nervous, okay? So, so here's the reason number one. Jesus ushers in new creation. Jesus ushers in new creation. We see this in the very first sentence in Matthew's gospel. This is the genealogy of Jesus, and here's our word, the Messiah, Jesus the anointed one, Jesus the king. This is the genealogy. Now, what's really interesting with Matthew, again, he's writing to Jews. And so what he's doing is that he's connecting the genealogy or the genesis of Jesus to the genesis of creation and the genesis of Adam. Like, let me read to you Genesis 2, 4. Uh, These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. And then in Genesis 5, this is the book of the of the generations of Adam. So what Matthew is really trying to do, he's for the Jews, he's saying uh, the, 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 the heavens that were created in Genesis 1 and 2, now we have new creation that has dawned. Now why did new creation have to dawn? Because Genesis 5, we have the author of Genesis, he's outlining the generations of Adam, but what happened prior to Genesis 5? Well, Adam and Eve sinned and they damaged the image of God on their life and they brought chaos to the created 
order. And so the reason why Jesus had to come was to remake and to redeem and to restore the created order and to redeem and restore mankind. And so Matthew, right out of the gate in the very first sentence, he's telling us and he's telling the Jews that the dawn of new creation is here in the person of Jesus Christ. So you can think of it this way. In the book of Genesis, we have the story of the creation and the story of the fall. So basically chapters one, chapter one and chapter two. Well, with Jesus, we have chapters three and four, redemption and restoration. And so that's the overarching story of the Bible. Creation, fall, redemption, restoration. Now, I, here's what I know. I know our culture loves stories. And we definitely love stories that project a hero. Uh, there's an author by the name of Joseph Campbell who wrote a book, and it's a very influential book, and it's entitled The Hero with the Thousand Faces. And so Joseph Campbell has influenced people like George Lucas. And what he says in every culture, in every civilization, there is a monomyth of a hero, and he calls it, he calls it the hero's journey. So when we watch movies like The Avenger, when we watch movies like Harry Potter, uh, Hunger Games, Divergent, uh, when we see movies and trilogies like Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, and there's this focus on the hero, you can thank Joseph Campbell for doing all of the research to say every culture under the face of the, the sun, every culture has had a hero. Well, here's the thing about our movies and the novels that we read is that they're fiction. They're like once upon a time fairy tales, but they speak to the longings of our heart. But what Matthew is saying to us and what we believe as Christians when it comes to the Bible is that Jesus is not once upon a time, he's not a once upon a time fairy tale. No, he is for a such a time as this real reality king who has come and is here. Like that's what we believe as Christians. And so right out of the gate, one of the reasons why we should sing is that Jesus ushers in new creation. But there's a second reason. Jesus fulfills God's promises. Jesus fulfills God's promises. And again, we see this in the very first verse. He goes on, Matthew does, the son of David and the son of Abraham. Now, I'm sure even if you're not a believer, you've probably heard of King David and Bathsheba. You, you've probably, if you've even grown up in church, but you kind of wandered away, you've probably heard of Abraham, Father Abraham, who had many sons. You all, we, we did that growing up at Vacation Bible School. But they are two key characters in the story in the Old Testament. And God came to both of those men, and he gave them both promises. To Abraham, we see multiple promises, but one in particular is found in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. That God is going to rescue Abraham, basically. He's going to save Abraham, and he's going to promise Abraham that he will become a great name and a great nation, and that through Abraham, all of the families, all of the nations of the earth will be blessed through Abraham and his line. That's a promise. Well, to King David, God is actually going to promise David someone from his line that he will have a kingdom, an everlasting kingdom that will have no end. It will be an eternal kingdom that will come from one of David's descendants. Now, in the person of Jesus is what Matthew is saying is that God has fulfilled those promises that he made to Abraham and David in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, here's something else that is interesting in Matthew 1 and 2 and really throughout the gospel of Matthew. This word fulfilled will keep popping up. And this was to fulfill what the prophet said. This was to fulfill what the prophets said. Now, what, what is Matthew getting at? Is that what Jesus has done is that he, he is the fulfillment of all of the promises that God made in the Old Testament. That's why Paul will write in his epistle in, or in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Here's what Paul, the Apostle Paul, will say. For all of the promises of God find their yes in Christ. So just think about it this way. I'm sure that there's been many people in your life that have broke promises. It could have been your parents. They could be politicians, they could be teachers, they could be mentors. They've promised you some things that you really got excited about and then only to find that they did not fulfill 
their promises. Well, here's the thing that we know about God is that whatever he promises, he always fulfills. He is a promise keeper. He never breaks promises. So if you're looking for somebody that you can trust, that you can go ahead and take it to the bank, that you can stake your life on, the promises, uh, look no further than the scriptures. Look no further than God. Look no further than Jesus God is a promise keeper. Well, the third reason why our hearts should want to sing to the king is, and this is one of my favorites, by the way, Jesus identifies with all kinds of people. Jesus identifies with all kinds of people. Like if you read the genealogy, and I know if you've read the genealogy devotionally, you're thinking, oh my gosh, I can't even pronounce these names. These are really hard names. I don't know who these people are. And so you're tempted just to pass over the genealogy, right? Well, here's why you shouldn't pass over the genealogy because it's not really like a phone. It's not like reading the phone book where it could get a little bit boring. But genealogies in this day, in in the day in which Matthew wrote, they acted like resumes. And here's what we know in our culture today is that you need to have a really good resume to get a good resume paying job to get a good job. And so there's actually resume services to help you design your resume so that they could get, so that your resume can land you a good job. Well, when you read Jesus's resume, ain't that good. (laughs) I mean, that basically it's like one of those things where you're like, "Uh, no, we'll pass over you, Jesus. Like Jesus would not be able to land a job at, you know, definitely a good paying job at Google or Apple or any any of those big tech companies there in Silicon Valley. No, they they would pass over Jesus's resume. Maybe Jesus's resume could fit more where I come from, Mumford, Tennessee. Like you're thinking to yourself, I don't even know where Mumford is. Exactly, right? Jesus could have got a job in Mumford, just probably not in Silicon Valley. But, but that's what genealogies, you know, read like. They read like resumes. Well, Jesus doesn't really have a good resume. Why? Well, why doesn't Jesus have a good resume, Josh? Well, I'm so glad that you asked that question. You're really on top of things at home. That coffee must be kicking in now. So here's the reason why. Because he includes women. He includes, I mean, great sinners, like great sinners. And he includes outsiders, so, so he includes women, sinners, and outsiders, okay? So, so when we look at, like, Judah, like, let, let's, pick, let's pick a couple of names. Judah. Oh, who was Judah? Well, did you know Judah slept with his daughter-in-law? Yikes. <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. It, yes, taboo stuff, like, back in, you know, like, I mean, really crazy stuff. Uh, let, let's pick, pick another one. What about Rahab? Well, Rahab was not a Jew. She was a Gentile, and she was a prostitute, yet she's part of Jesus' lineage. Uh, Ruth, Ruth, again, was a Moabite, was a Gentile. Uh, Here's another one, and we don't even know her name. Matthew just kind of refers to her, and that's Bathsheba. Well, who was Bathsheba? Well, she was the woman that David had an affair with. And then we see David. David's part of that. He was an adulterer. He was a murderer. And then we see Manasseh. Manasseh was a, was a king. Uh, he was an evil king, by the way. So if you go back in 2 Kings 21, you can read about all the evil stuff Manasseh did. But there are some other, you know, uh, uh, names uh, on here like Elihud. Uh, you know, you're like, who's Elihud? Well, I, you know, you really have to go back and really dig to find out who he is. So he's kind of insignificant. So what is my point and what is Matthew's point is that Jesus identifies with whoever you are. Whoever you think you are, if you think that you have a bad, tainted past, Jesus identifies with you. If you think you are an outsider, an outcast, uh, maybe you're estranged from your family, let me tell you something, Jesus identifies with you. Maybe you're struggling with shame and guilt and and you, you are struggling in sin and you know it and you feel ashamed. You feel embarrassed. Let me tell you something, Jesus, the king of the cosmos, identifies with you. So it doesn't matter who, and, and here's what I would say. I know that there's probably a lot of wealthy people listening to this. I want you to understand that Jesus identifies with you because there are wealthy, powerful people that are mentioned in his genealogy. So think about it this way, is that Jesus is the king for all mankind, no matter who you are. And then the fourth reason why our hearts should want to sing to the king is that he came to save sinners. Now, I understand this is where our culture gets a little sque- you know, squeamish. Sinner? You call me a sinner, Josh? Well, I'm not. The Bible is. God is. He's calling you a sinner. And let me just tell you why. Because you might be sitting there today and you're thinking, I'm not a sinner. You know, but, but let's, let's just really think about this, okay? 
Why did Jesus have to come to save sinners? Well, you have to go all the way back to Genesis, right? God created a perfect world where there was no sin. Everything operated according to God's plan. And I know that there's a lot of people here on staff at Shoreline. Like I've, I've learned about Sean and haven't really got to, you know, kind of talk with him yet, but love systems and processes. And, and so when we create systems and processes, we want them to flourish. We want them to work. We want them to bring about fruit. Well, that's what God created when he created the cosmos. It was systems and processes that work to the unteenth degree. It's beautiful, it's harmonious. And then he had created mankind in his image, put them in the Garden of Eden. And there they enjoyed perfect relationship with one another and perfect relationship with God. I mean, it literally was heaven on earth. And God said, listen, have complete freedom here in the garden, but I don't want you to eat from this one tree. For the day that you eat from this one tree, you shall surely die. Well, I mean, here's the thing. I mean, Adam and Eve... They did exactly what God told them not to do, ate from this tree, and then at that moment they realized something was wrong. Something went bad. And because because they were created in God's image, think of it in a mirror. When you look into the mirror like you probably did this morning, uh, you know, a perfect image was reflected from that mirror. But could you imagine if you took a if you took a hammer to that mirror and it shattered the glass, then there would be this distortion and fragmentation uh, of, of the reflection. That's our world. And then if you can think of it this way, is that what God had created perfect and in great order, now mankind, because they sinned, they entered, they they brought back chaos. So the reason why our world is broken and the reason why our world is in chaos, and, and here's the thing we know about 2020, is we have 2020 vision that something is wrong with our world. We're broken. Here's what's happened. Jesus has come to save sinners. So what he has come to do, he has come to reverse the curse of sin in the cosmos, and he has come to repair and redeem and restore the image of God on our life. And here's the thing about human beings, and we believe that the Bible teaches is that human beings will never be completely satisfied at peace in their life until their heart finds rest in Jesus. He has come to save sinners. And those are the reasons why our heart should want to sing. Those four reasons. So if you think about it this way, maybe you're sitting out there today and you want a little bit of inspiration, you know, to worship. Here's the inspiration. The incarnation is our inspiration. Uh, The reason why we are even inspired to worship God is because God became flesh and God dwelt among us. And so think about it this way. The incarnation is our inspiration to worship. But let me answer this question, question number two. How we know we mean what we sing. So how how do we know we mean what we sing? Now, this is really for believers. Because the reason why this point is so important is that I believe that there are a lot of followers of Jesus, a lot of Christians, maybe they attend church, maybe they read their Bible. And, And so with their lips, they profess Jesus, but their lives are far from him. Like Brennan Manning, he is quoted as saying the greatest uh, single cause of atheism in the world is professing Jesus with our lips but denying him with our life. And so here's the question that I want believers to wrestle, or here's some questions that I want believers to wrestle with that basically act as an assessment of whether or not you really mean what you sing, whether or not you really mean what you worship. So if you say you worship Jesus, how do you know? Here, ask yourself these four questions. Uh, number one is, uh, do, uh, do you obey the king? Do you obey the king? Now, we see this in the life of Joseph. So Joseph and Mary, they are engaged. Uh, they have not consummated the, the engagement yet, or have, they have not consummated the marriage. And so if you're a teenager or a child and you're listening to this, you ask your parents what that means, and they would be happy to answer that for you. But they're engaged right now, and it, and, and, and it just so happens that Mary becomes pregnant. Now, Joseph knows it. it's not by him. And Mary's like, well, it's not by any other man. But, but Joseph really, I mean, he's having a hard time with it. He's struggling. And so he has, he has made up his mind that he is going to divorce or separate from Mary 
uh, privately because she's already going to have enough public shame. So he's a righteous man, loves, he loves God, he wants to do right. And so he, he, he's made up his mind that he is going to kind of separate from Mary and kind of go on his way. Well, that night, an angel comes to him and says, hey, don't worry. Oh, what, what, what has happened to Mary? It's of God. It's of the Holy Spirit. So here's what God wants you to do. Take Mary as your wife because she's going to give birth to a baby boy, and you shall call his name Jesus, which means Yahweh saves. Well, so what happens? Joseph, he wakes up, and he does exactly what the angel had told him God wanted him to do. Let me just say it this way, believers, is that sometimes obedience to the king is not easy. It's not easy. Because what what Joseph was signing up for when he took Mary back as his wife was a very tough, hard life. They would be a scandalous family. It would have been much easier for Joseph just to walk away, find him another kind of pure like woman, settle down there in in kind of Podunkville and just have just a family and have kids and enjoy his life. But he doesn't. Because following Jesus, obeying God is costly. So do you obey the king? Uh, The second question I want you to ask is, do you have faith in the king? Do you have faith in the king? This is basically coming from the wise men. Uh, They are Gentiles. They live in the east, so probably present-day Iraq, and they see this bright star. Uh, They know some prophecies. Uh, And here's what's so interesting is how would they know prophecies? Well, you remember the guy named Daniel, Daniel in the lion's den? Well, he uh, was a Jew who was there in Babylon in exile, but he rose in the ranks and he became one of the chief magi in that day that he lived. Well, he also wrote prophecies through the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit through the pen of Daniel would write prophecies about a coming king. And so so many scholars believe that the legacy and the faithfulness and the faithful witness of Daniel lasted for hundreds of years to where these wise men were looking for the cosmic king. And so they see the star, and they think it's the king star, and so they travel hundreds, if not a 1,000 miles because of a star, because of prophecy. Think about it. They had to have faith. Let me ask you this, believer. Do you have faith in the word of God? Do you have faith in God's word to the point that you would be willing to do something that really looks crazy to the world, like the wise men? Number three is this. Do you surrender and submit to the king? Do you surrender and submit to the king? Again, wise men, they finally get to the house. Now, here's the thing about uh, if you have a a nativity set, uh, if you have wise men with your shepherds, they're kind of in the wrong place because the wise men didn't come to about 12 to 18 months after Jesus was born. So here's what we do in the Laxton family. We put the wise men at the other end of the room uh, just to be faithful to the Bible, right? Uh, but, but the wise men, they finally come, they get to the house, and they fall to their knees. Could you imagine these wealthy noblemen with great power falling to their knees in the presence of of poor peasant parents and their baby. I mean, foolishness. But why do they do it? Because they believe Jesus was the king. They surrendered and submitted to the king. Now, I have a question that I always ask when I read about the wise men is, why would they be searching for a king? I mean, they have money, they have wealth, they have power, yet they traveled all this way, and now they surrender and bow down and worship the king. Why? Here, I, I have a guess. We don't see it in the text, but here's my guess is that you have to imagine in that region in which they grew up in, it had, it basically it had turmoil after turmoil, conflict after conflict. Just think over the last 700 years that the wise men, you know, in the region of the wise men, uh, they had the Assyrians come in, they had the Babylonians come in, they had the Medes come in, the Persians come in, and now the Roman Empire all conquering that territory. Just conflict after conflict, war after war. And now they read prophecy about a cosmic king, a universal king who's going to unite nations and is going to bring everlasting peace. Listen, they got jacked up about that. They got jazzed up about that because it resonated with their heart. And here's the thing that I would say, believer, is that hopefully that would resonate with us that Jesus has come to make all things new. Jesus has come to bring heaven to earth. Jesus has come to bring peace on earth. And then the last question that I would ask is, do you offer gifts and treasures fit for the king. Well, the wise men, they brought three gifts. Some people think there was three wise men uh, just because of the three gifts. We don't, that's probably not true. Here's what we do know. It was the large caravan. 
Uh, they had to have security. They brought their family. But they bring these three treasured gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, costly. Let me ask you this. Do what, is what you give to the king, is it costly? And I'm not just talking about money. I'm talking about time, talents, treasures. Because I wrote down this statement. I think it's a really good statement. The gifts of the giver reflect the greatness of the receiver. Right? The gifts of the giver reflect the greatness of the receiver. So let me ask you this. If Jesus is receiving the gifts we're given, how great are our gifts? Because the gifts of the giver will reflect the greatness of the receiver. The third question that I want to answer in just uh, the few minutes that I have left is this. Here's the question. What happens when we sing to the king? What happens when we sing to the king? I just want to draw your attention to one particular place in verse 17. Matthew 1, verse 17. We would have missed it if we were just reading devotionally. But here's what it says. Verse 17, thus there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. What happens when we sing to the king? Here's the answer. We experience peace and rest. Here's what Matthew is getting at. Uh, the, the Jews believed in, in, the, you know, in the number seven. Like the, the number seven had great ramifications uh, for the Jews. On the seventh day, God rested. So they had to have a Sabbath. But then like every, uh, every seventh year, they had a sabbatical year. And every seven times seven, so every 49 years, they were supposed to have a year of Jubilee. Here's what N.T. Wright, a New Testament scholar, says about this verse. All the generations to that point were 14 times three. That is six sevens. With Jesus, we get the seventh seven. He is the jubilee in person. He is the one who will rescue Israel from its long continued nightmare. So what Matthew is saying as he writes verse 17 is that Jesus is the cosmic jubilee. He is the one that is he is the one that is bringing freedom. He is the one that is bringing salvation. He is the one who is bringing true rest. He is the one who is bringing true Sabbath to the world, to individuals. And so here's my question. Does your heart sing to the king? Does your heart sing to the king? Because who Jesus is, the coming Messiah, should make your hearts want to sing. Let's pray. Jesus, would you do a work through the preaching of your word and through the truth of how you are the cosmic king come to make all things new. So I pray for every single person who would listen to this, that are far from you, will you draw them near? For those who are already near, will you conform them and shape them more into the image because you are our king and we surrender and we submit to you. We worship you. We adore you. Josh, thank you for ministering to us and bringing God's word. And I hope you've been as blessed as I've been. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I want to invite you to, uh, now that you've heard this message, if it struck your heart, as you do with other messages, pass it on to someone else. Send the link to somebody else and invite them to listen to this message and understand who Jesus is as the Messiah. Uh, Before I send you off with a word of blessing, I want to give a few invitations to you. One is that we will be meeting next Sunday on campus here. Again, we follow all the protocols and our county and our state guidelines allow churches to gather outdoors following the same guidelines we've been using. So nothing will change for us here at Shoreline. Uh, So be sure you register for church next Sunday. And then Christmas Eve, we have a 1 o'clock, a 2.30, and a 4 o'clock service. 1 o'clock, 2.30, 4 o'clock. The 4 o'clock one is filling up quickly. Go online, register. We're praying for great weather. Join us in praying for that and a great time celebrating all the services during the daytime. We miss the morning cool. We miss the evening darkness. It's a perfect time of the day. Three services. Invite a friend along to join you online or on campus here to worship. If you want prayer for anything going on in your life or for somebody you love, call or text the number you see on the screen there or contact us us here at the church during the week. We want to pray with you. We want to lift you up and come alongside of you and pray for you, so be sure that you do that. And then also, if you're new, maybe uh, maybe, uh, somebody liked or shared this message in the middle and you jumped in, you're new at Shoreland, or maybe you just jumped in for the first time at the beginning of the service because a friend invited you. We want to invite you to connect here more at Shoreline. So the number you see right there, just text the word welcome. And when you text that, we will send you a digital guest card and you can fill that out and we can answer any questions you have about Shoreline Church and come alongside you and encourage you. 
And so we thank you for joining us for worship. I want to send you off with a word of blessing and again a warm invitation to join us next Sunday at 9 and 11 and Christmas Eve. But receive these words of blessing. As you close this time, may you walk into the rest of your day and to the rest of your life with a fresh perspective that the Messiah, the cosmic King, Jesus the Christ, the anointed one, is with you. Adore him. Sing praise. Celebrate his goodness. And let others know he's for them too. God bless you. Merry Christmas. We'll see you next Sunday.